live in interesting times. For the headlines. The U.S. still believes the fully verified denuclearization of North Korea is possible by the end of President Donald Trump's first term. A senior official said, despite warnings, a key rocket launch site appears to have resumed operations. U.S. President Donald Trump's former campaign chief, Paul Manafort, was sentenced to 47 months in prison on Thursday for tax crimes and bank fraud in the highest profile case, yet stemming from special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad said Southeast Asian economies must focus on the development of certain industri industries to improve intra-region tr trade and local business leaders are in favor of this. And Crew Dragon, the new vessel built by SpaceX for NASA, is set to return Friday off the coast of Florida, the most perilous part of a mission to prove it can take U.S. astronauts to the International Space Station. We welcome our viewers here in the Philippines and around the world. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sam Cepeda. And now to the news. The U.S. still believes the fully verified denuclearization of North Korea is possible by the end of President Donald Trump's first term, a senior official said, despite warnings, a key rocket launch site appears to have resumed operations. The specialized website 38 North and the Center for Strategic and International Studies used commercial satellite imagery to track construction at the site, which they said began before last week's aborted summit in Hanoi between Trump and North Korea's Kim Jong-un. Images taken on March 6 showed that a rail-mounted structure to transfer rockets to the launching pad appeared to have been completed and may now be operational. The official confirmed that Washington would seek from Pyongyang clarifications on the purposes of rebuilding the site, adding so far the U.S. has not reached any specific conclusion about what's happening there. The State Department spokesperson Robert Palladino said the United States remains ready to engage North Korea in a constructive negotiation. Our message here publicly uh, and privately for that matter is we're ready. Um, we remain ready to engage North Korea in a constructive negotiation. Kim had agreed to shutter Suhai at a summit with South or South President Moon Jae-in in Pyongyang as part of confidence building measures and satellite pictures in August suggested workers were dismantling the engine test stand. Trump equivoc uh, equivocated when asked Thursday if he was disappointed about the news. I would be very disappointed if that were happening. Uh, it's a very early report. We're the ones that put it out. But uh, I would be very, very disappointed in Chairman Kim, and I don't think I will be, but we'll see what happens. We'll take a look. It'll ultimately get solved. U.S. President Donald Trump's former campaign chief, Paul Manafort, was sentenced to 47 months in prison for tax crimes and bank fraud in the highest profile case yet, stemming from special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. Manafort was convicted in August of five counts of filing false income tax returns, two counts of bank fraud, and one count of failing to report a foreign bank account. Prosecutors allege that Manafort used offshore bank accounts in Cyprus and other countries to hide more than $55 million he earned from political consulting services he provided to Ukrainian politicians. The money was used to support a lavish lifestyle, 
which included purchases of luxury homes and cars, antique rugs, and expensive clothes, including an $18,500 python jacket or jacket. Manafort still faces sentencing in a second case in Washington next week, where the maximum penalty is 10 years and the judge has appeared more sympathetic to prosecutors. The charges against Manafort involved work he did for 10 years on behalf of Moscow allied politicians in Ukraine and nothing related to the 2016 election, an issue he argued in asking the court for leniency. Here's defense attorney Kevin Downing speaking after the sentencing. As you heard in court today, Mr. Manafort finally got to speak for himself. He made clear he accepts responsibility for his conduct. And I think most importantly, what you saw today is the same thing that we had said from day one. There is absolutely no evidence that Paul Manafort was involved with any collusion with any government official from Russia. God. Let the record reflect that Director Mueller responded in the Manafort is one of six top advisors and associates of Trump's 2016 presidential election campaign to be charged in the Mueller investigation. Besides Manafort and Gates, four other former Trump associates face charges or have pleaded guilty to charges stemming from the Mueller investigation. Former National Security Advisor Michael Flynn pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI about his contacts with Russian officials and is awaiting sentencing. Trump's former personal attorney Michael Cohen is, is to begin serving a three-year prison sentence on May 6th for fraud, tax evasion, illegal campaign contributions, and lying to Congress. George Papadopoulos, a foreign policy advisor to the Trump campaign, pleaded guilty to lying to the FBI and was sentenced to two weeks in prison. Another Trump advisor, Roger Stone, awaits trial. Trump has repeatedly denied any, collect or in any election collusion with Moscow and denounced the probe by Mueller, a former FBI director, as a political witch hunt. And options that others don't have. They fear it because they're born. President Donald Trump's real estate group, the Trump Organization, was sued Thursday by his former lawyer Michael Cohen for millions of dollars in legal fees. Cohen says the company was obliged to pay. Cohen alleges the company stopped paying his legal costs related to special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia probe and other matters only after he began cooperating last year in investigations that have since implicated the president in wrongdoing. The Trump Organization's failure without any reasonable basis to pay Mr. Cohen's attorney's fees and costs and other amounts incurred by Mr. Cohen is in service to and at the behest of the organization and its principals, directors and officers constitutes a breach of the Trump organization's indemnification obligations, said the lawsuit filed in New York. It was the latest chapter in the story of Cohen's break with his former bro or former boss Cohen, who was sentenced in December to three years in prison, was implicated or has implicated Trump and the White House in the charges of campaign finance fraud and lying to Congress that he pleaded guilty to. His lawyer, Lanny Davis, yesterday also alleged that representatives of the president dangled the possibility of a pardon to Cohen last year before Cohen began cooperating with investigators examining Trump's 2016 presidential election campaign and Trump organization. In the lawsuit, Cohen notes his former position as executive vice president and special counsel at the Trump organization where he became known as Trump's fixer. He was also a Trump campaign advisor. In those roles, he says he made hush payment arrangements ahead of the 2016 election for two women who allegedly had affairs with Trump. After the campaign became subject of investigation, Cohen's suit claims 
He and the Trump organization made an agreement that the company would repay his legal costs. It did pay those costs until June 2018, when it became apparent that Cohen would be cooperating with investigators when the Trump organization failed to pay a $1 million bill to Cohen's lawyers. The firm McDermott, will, or McDermott, Will, Emery, they quit representing him, the lawsuit says. Between that time and January 25, Cohen accumulated another $1.9 million in legal bills, which he says the Trump organization should pay. In addition, the lawsuit said the company is obliged to pay the $1.9 million that the court fined Cohen in his plea deal last December. Efforts to curb the Democratic Republic of Congo's worst Ebola outbreak are stumbling. Medical charity and MSF warned Thursday, blaming the role of the security forces in the response and other toxic relations with local communities. Seven months into the outbreak, the Ebola response is failing to bring the epidemic under control, Doctors Without Borders said in a statement. It highlighted that more than, or it highlighted that more than 40 percent of deaths are occurring in communities rather than in Ebola treatment centers. MSF suspended its activities at two treatment centers in North Kivu after the sites were attacked. In the past month alone, MSF Chief Joan Liu told reporters in Geneva that there had been more than 30 attacks and incidents involving elements of the Ebola response. I have just returned from DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, where people are facing the biggest Ebola outbreak in the country's history. What is clear is that there is a great hostility against the whole of the Ebola response. In the last month alone, there were more than 30 different incidents and attacks against elements of the response. The ongoing Ebola outbreak is a tenth in DRC's history and the second largest ever recorded worldwide. The worst ever outbreak, which was centered in West Africa from 2013 to 2016, killed more than 11,000 people, the Ebola response has so far failed to be a humanized response and we all share responsibility for this. Explosives left behind by the Islamic State group in Iraq's Mosul took 12-year-old Abdallah's left leg, but another kind of terror may cost him his arm, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Watch this. Ibni ma adi jawab lil ilaj. Ibni khalas ma adi jawab. Ay ilaj kumna nuntil wa ma adi jawab. ورحت على اساس اركب له طرف من شافوه قالوا هذا عنده التهابات وبكتيريا قام واحد من الدكاتره جزاء الله اللي بخير انطاني رقم المنظمه خبرت المنظمه على الفور قالوا لي جيب وتجيني هي راح قالوا لي راح تتني سبع ايام اذا طلع الفحص مالك مال السرع اذا ما بيك شيء تطلع واذا بيك شيء تحطك بالعسل فاحنا بالعراق طورت عندنا المايكرو اورجانيزم الى يعني احنا صرنا في مقدمة في في مصاف الدول اللي تطور البكتيريا المقاومة للمضادات الحيوية، طبعا اكيد الصراعات كان لها دور كبير واخرها صراع الحرب اللي دارت اللي دارت بالموصل، طبعا احنا شفنا يعني فد بريك ثرو فد 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 حالات من انتشار واستشراء البكتيريا المقاومة للمضادات الحيوية. A Paris court on Thursday jailed a Franco-Algerian veteran of jihadist conflicts to 16 years in prison over trips he made to Syria between 2012 and 2014 to serve with a jihadist group. The, sent or the sentence is one of the longest handed out in France to a returnee from the Syrian battlegrounds. The heavy sentence was due in part to his earlier offenses. 
the bearded 50-year-old Ahmed Laiduni had been jailed for seven years back in 2004 and his part in recruiting fighters for Afghanistan during that trial, he denied having attended paramilitary training camps in Bosnia and Afghanistan. After serving that sentence, he is believed to have traveled to Syria and joined up with the Al-Qaeda-affiliated Al-Nusra Front between 2012 and 2014. One of his associates there, fellow French-Algerian Sliman Kalfawi, was convicted over a plot to bomb Strasbourg Christmas market in 2004. The prosecutor said Laiduni has held a deadly ideology from more than 20 years. More news will be coming your way when Eagle News International returns. Health is our most important asset and it should always be a constant.
the former daughter of former or the daughter of former Uzbekistan President Islam Karimov was charged in New York in connection with a decade-long scheme to pay her more than $865 million in bribes, prosecutors said. It is one of the largest schemes ever charged under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York said in a statement. The charges against Gulnara Karimova were announced after Russia's leading telecoms firm MTS, which is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, said it had agreed in related proceedings to pay $850 million to U.S. authorities. Gulnara Karimova, 46, is a former Uzbek government official and the daughter of Islam Karimov, who ruled the ex-Soviet Republic from 1990 until his death in 2016. Karimova, former Uzbek ambassador to the United Nations, is charged with one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering along with Begzod Akhmedov, 44, former general director of Usdun Robita, an Uzbek subsidiary of MTS. Akhmedov, who lives in Russia, allegedly helped orchestrate the graft scheme on behalf of MTS and two other telecom firms, Vimpelcom Ltd. or Vimpelcom Limited of Russia and Sweden's Telia Company AB and their Uzbek su subsidiaries. Between approximately 2001 and 2012, Karimova and Akhmenov agreed that Akhmenov would solicit and obtain corrupt bribes for Karimova from telecommunications companies, the prosecutor's statement said. Prior to Thursday's settlement with MTS, Telia in 2017 and Vimpelcom in 2016 also agreed to settle with payments of hundreds of millions of dollars each. Karimova, once a high-profile diplomat and pop singer, was being held under house arrest in her homeland after being convicted on fraud and money laundering charges in 2017 and sentenced to five years. Uzbek authorities this week said she had violated the terms of her house arrest and had been sent to prison where she would remain until the end of her sentence. The Uzbek judiciary accuses her of being part of a criminal group controlling assets worth more than 1 billion euros. U.S. prosecutors say their investigation has so far yielded more than $2.6 billion in fines and penalties globally. The Department of Justice has also filed civil complaints seeking the forfeiture of more than $850 million held in bank accounts in Switzerland, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Ireland. These are the graft payments made by MTS of Vimpelcom and Telia on to Karimova, or funds involved in laundering those bribes, prosecutors allege. Five years since the disappearance of flight MH370, Chinese relatives of those on board asked for support from the Chinese government and are left dissatisfied after meeting with a low-level official from China's foreign ministry. Here's more. Yeah, 所以说为什么我们说这是一个政治问题
three women serving 30 year sentences for falling foul of El Salvador's severe anti abortion laws walked free from prison Thursday after the Central American country's Supreme Court ordered their release. Alba Lorenza Rodriguez, Maria del Francito Orellana, and Cynthia Marcela Rodriguez emerged from the prison at Leopango outside San Salvador to loud cheers from well-wishers and rights groups. Each had been convicted of aggravated homicide after losing their babies by miscarriage. Mucha alegría, mucha alegría nos representa. Le agradecemos a la agrupación ciudadana, a las organizaciones nacionales e internacionales que los han apoyado y esperamos que el Estado reconozca también que hay muchas mujeres aquí adentro que también son inocentes y que primero Dios un día puedan recuperar su libertad también. Agradecemos. Earlier, El Salvador's Deputy Justice and Security Minister Raul Lopez handed the women a letter notifying them their sentences had been commuted by the court on the eve of International Women's Day. Abortion carries jail sentences of between two and eight years, though even women who abort due to birth defects or health complications risk jail sentences of up to 40 years if convicted of aggravated homicide. Campaigners say some have been jailed after suffering miscarriages. At the tease, President Morena Herrera said that 33 women serving time under El Salvador's draconian anti-abortion laws had, been, had their sentences commuted since 2009. Around 20 women remain imprisoned serving long sentences. The Supreme Court said in its rulings that the sentences handed down to the women were disproportionate and immoral, the abortion rights organization Agdati said. The women lived in inadequate social, economic and family conditions had their families had been affected by their incarceration since the economic contribution of women to their families is fundamental, the court said. Se le concede la gracia de la conmutación reduciendo la pena que le había sido impuesta por una, de, por una pena menor y ordenando su puesta en libertad inmediatamente este mismo día. Por... Alba Rodríguez, 30, was pregnant from a rape and lost her baby five months into her turn in December 2009. The mother of two other children, she was arrested by police at the hospital. She subsequently went to for postnatal treatment and charged with aggravated homicide, according to the Center for Reproductive Rights. Six months later, she was sentenced to 30 years imprisonment. She served nine years and two months of her sentence. Maria Aureliana miscarried in 2010 while working as a domestic. She was arrested after being taken to hospital in San Salvador. Later, she was, or she too, was sentenced to 30 years. She served nine years and three days until she walked free on Thursday. Cynthia Rodriguez worked as a cleaner in a clothing factory when she miscarried without seeking medical assistance. She was convicted under the abortion laws and sentenced to 30 years in 2009. She walked out of prison Thursday, having served 11 years, one month and three days of her sentence. Esta resolución reconoce que las condenas fueron, fueron injustas y por eso ha cambiado, eh, digamos, una, una pena de 30 años a, a, al, al tiempo que tienen en este momento, pues algunas 10 años, otras 8 años. American freelance journalist Cody Weddle returns to the U.S. after being detained in Venezuela by Nicolas Maduro's regime. Watch this. It has been a long uh, 12 hours. I was there detained for pretty much the entire day uh, with my face covered with a ski mask uh, with the counterintelligence folks there. 
encima de 38. Tienes que buscar la puerta de eso. There's a lot of paranoia as well, especially within the armed forces. So um, I basically reported the truth, which is that uh, in the armed forces there's a lot of discontent, especially among the rank and file. And that's what I continue to hear and continue to hear from plenty of officials. Um, and I reported that, and I guess uh, they don't want that to be uh, public information. <laughs> U.S. lawmakers on Thursday overwhelmingly approved a resolution condemning anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred and bigotry following an acrimonious debate over a Muslim congresswoman's comments about Israel policy. The measure, which passed 407 to 23, did not reprimand Minnesota freshman Ilan Omar by name after her remarks that several lawmakers deemed anti-Semitic but it condemned hateful expressions of intolerance that are contradictory to values and aspirations. Several Republicans and a few Democrats openly complained that the measure was watered down because what originated as a targeting of anti-Semitism was broadened out into include or to include all forms of bigotry, including Islamophobia and discrimination against other minorities. It is uh, in the spirit of unity and solidarity with my colleagues as we come together in this chamber of our American democracy to condemn all forms of hatred, racism, prejudice, and discrimination with a hopefully single and strong voice. It is profoundly disturbing reality that anti-Semitism is on the rise in America today and anti-Semitic attacks increasingly are at the highest rate on record. Uh, appalling acts of hatred and bigotry are being inflicted in our, uh, on all uh, uh, elements of our society. Most of Venezuela was plunged into darkness on Thursday evening after a huge power cut that the government of President Nicolas Maduro blamed on sabotage. Apart from a few buildings with electricity supplied from a private generator, AFP reporters said the capital Caracas was hit by a total blackout at 4.50 p.m. just before nightfall. That included the city metro along with telephone and internet services, one of the most dangerous cities in the world. Caracas streets are usually deserted after dark. Local press reports said the power cut affected most of the country. The state electric company Cor Corpo Elec on its Twitter account said they sabotaged the central generator. It's part of the electric war against the state. They also said they will not allow it and they were working to re-establish the service. The central hydroelectric generator in Guri in the eastern Bolivar state is one of the most important of its kind in Latin America alongside that in Itaipu on the border between Brazil and Paraguay. Power cuts are a regular occurrence in Venezuela which is suffering from an economic crisis. Experts blame the government for a lack of investment in infrastructure while the regime points the finger to saboteurs without ever identifying them. A year ago, Maduro asked the armed forces to provide security to protect the country's hydroelectric generators, but the power cuts continue. Alta sacada de ir la luz y caminando de verdad que me queda sumamente lejos. Las camionetas es muy poco el transporte que hay ahorita y el tomar una camioneta ahorita a estas alturas es imposible. Bueno, hasta ahora venía a comprar algunos alimentos, queso, carne, no puedo comprar porque no hay efectivo tampoco. 
Tú vas al banco a retirar efectivo y no hay. No sea médico, inclusive con este mismo tema de luz, que puede ser una, una ineficiencia institucional, una ineficiencia personal, pero también que no, que alguna empresa no le quiera suministrar eh, algún insumo a Venezuela. Y si se lo suministra, bueno, sencillamente será, será sancionado sí, en el, el mundo. We'll be back with more news right after this break. Health is our most important asset and it should always be a constant effort to seek ways to take care of it. That includes professional medical help from the best available. The Manila Beijing Medical Associated Incorporated is known as one of the most specialized centers in medical services, backed by several experienced physicians in Chinese medicine. At an accuracy rate of 98%, countless patients who visited Manila Beijing Medical Associated Incorporated have already been treated and cured. Marami po hospital na napuntahan, pero wala rin nangyayari. Somebody introduced me to Manila Beijing Medical Associated. After two treatments, gumanda ang pakiramdam ko. My friends introduced me Manila Beijing Medical Associated and luckily I got cured. So I sincerely want to thank the doctors of Manila Beijing Medical Associated. For the past 30 years, ang dami ko lang na-take na mga gamot, nothing happened to me. So until one my friend introduced me to Manila Beijing Medical Associated, you know what, all my illness was cured. For any health problems or incurable diseases, you can visit Manila Beijing Medical Associated Incorporated, located at 843B Sabino Padilla Street, Binondo, Manila. Pet News, Linggo, alas 4 hanggang alas 5 ng hapon. The automakers behind Russian President Vladimir Putin's limousine, Aurus, make their European debut at the Geneva International Motor Show 2019. Take a look. starting the cereal production just uh, very soon and uh, it's really a renaissance of the premium class in Russia. He regularly gives his remarks. We note down, made some amendments, uh, but uh, it's really, uh, he's really proud of our Auros. What? Our aspiration, really, for the brand is to, to deliver a new style of vehicle, a style of comfort and luxury coming from Russia. Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad said Southeast Asian economies must focus on the development of certain industries to improve intra-region trade and local business leaders are in favor of this. At the Malaysia Philippines Business Forum held in Makati on Thursday, Mahathir said the Association of Southeast Asian Nations should now craft a policy framework that will specify what industries each member country should focus on with this, he argued ASEAN economies will be able to trade products and services that complement instead of compete. Bahatir said despite having 600 million people living in Southeast Asia, there are still or they are still looking at themselves as different countries with different domestic markets. He also said in the beginning of the ASEAN, there was this idea that they should divide the industries so that each industry can be centered in one country but will have the market of all the five original members. Mahathir argued that the proposal can be reassessed and redesigned in a manner that it can exploit the population of the ASEAN member states. 
Merchandise trade by the ASEAN amounted to $2.2 trillion in 2016, of which 23.1% has or was between the regional bloc's members. The ASEAN is targeting to lower the cost of trade transaction by 10% and double intra-region trade by 2025. The Malaysian leader arrived in the country on Wednesday for a two-day visit. Trade Secretary Ramon M. Lopez agreed with Matir's proposal as he said all efforts must now be exerted by the ASEAN towards strengthening its trade from within. Lopez explained that what they really need to work on is how to strengthen intra-ASEAN trade because he thinks while they have been talking about free trade agreements, there is a feeling that it is not yet that maximized. Total trade between ASEAN member states is just 25% of the regional bloc's total figures. Should leaders give Matir's proposal a chance, Lopez said the Philippines will make likely push for the development of its semiconductor industry, which is responsible for over half of the country's export pie. The proposal was well received by industry leaders for one, Steel Asia Manufacturing Corp. President Adrian S. Crisobal Jr. said the proposal has merit and that it is worth revisiting. He also said the world has changed and ASEAN has evolved into a potentially powerful economic bloc with a population of 600 million people. Finding ways to optimize ASEAN's growth and productivity will surely benefit all. The Regional Field Office of the Department of Agriculture is targeting to more than double with or more than double the area planted with coffee here following President Duterte's pronouncement that the DA will get a bigger budget next year. With a bigger budget, Carlota S. Madriaga, Regional Technical Director for Operations of DA RFO 10, said the agency will be able to double coffee areas in Bukidnon to 26,000 hectares by 2022 from the current 11,000 hectares. Bukidnon is a province that is well known for producing world-class coffee beans. Madriaga told reporters, they have a set of target of 15,000 hectares expansion until 2022. The RFO was instructed by Agriculture Secretary Emmanuel F. Pignol to increase their budget proposal. She added the 15,000 hectare expansion could be achieved in less than three years if they will be given the budget. Citing data from the Philippine Statistics Authority, Madriaga said northern Mindanao currently produces about 2,000 metric tons of green coffee beans annually. Madriaga did not give an estimate as to how much the regional office would need for their target, but Wilson Lag Lagdamen, DARFO10 senior agriculturist, said the agency spends 1.2 million pesos to procure 50,000 seedlings. One hectare of coffee area would require an average of 800 seedlings, according to Lagdamen. To hit its target, the regional office would need to spend at least 288 million pesos to provide 12 million seedlings, according to the computation of the Business Mirror. This year, DARFO10 procured 50,000 Robusta coffee seedlings and 20,000 Arabica coffee seedlings. The agency spent 300,000 for the seedlings and another 5 million pesos for its coffee nursery establishments. The region also plans to hike its average GCB yield to about 1 metric ton per hectare by 2022 from the current 230 kilograms per hectare, Madriaga said. She said this can be done by providing farmers with high-yielding seedlings for plantlets. Madriaga said the agency has distributed 4 million seedlings to coffee farmers in the region since 2015. She said the DARFO10 
has been procuring and distributing high quality planting materials to farmers in partnership with Nestle. A day after the price trade liberalization law took effect, an official of the National Economic and Development Authority, or NEDA, said traders encountered difficulties in retrieving their shipments at the port. Republic Act 11203, or the Rice Trade Liberalization Law, took effect on March 5. The law removed the quantitative restriction or rise on rise and replaced it with tariffs and removed the powers of the National Food Authority to issue import permits. Because of the new law, NEDA Assistant Secretary Mercedita A. Sombilia told the media that traders had complained to her that the Bureau of Customs refused to recognize the certificate of eligib or eligibility to import from the NFA. The COE is one of the permits and licenses issued by the NFA to rise importers. Sompilia said there were imports who were calling him saying the BOC refused to honor their COE. He told them all COEs that were given and approved by the NFA before March 5 should be processed as in the old regime. Sombilia said this was part of the discussions at the NFA Council meeting on March 5. She said the NFAC relayed its instructions to the BOC through the Department of Finance. She said the NFAC had requested the NFA to furnish the Council the list of COEs it issued. This, she said, would make it easier for the BOC to identify the shipments that would be exempted from the new rules. She added, there are provisions in the law that are self-executing. The repeal of the regulatory power of NFA, the imposition of the new tariff regime, the imposition of the new MAV, the imposition of the safety rules because under the new law, sanitary and phytosanitary clearances were required. Also, there is already the new importation guidelines which the NFA Council must release to avoid confusing the BOC. We'll be back with more news right after this break. Health is our most important asset and it should always be a constant effort to seek ways to take care of it. That includes professional medical help from the best available. The Manila Beijing Medical Associated Incorporated is known as one of the most specialized centers in medical services backed by several experienced physicians in Chinese medicine. At an accuracy rate of 98%, countless patients who visited Manila Beijing Medical Associated Incorporated have already been treated and cured. Marami po hospital na napuntahan, pero wala rin nangyayari. Somebody introduced me to Manila Beijing Medical Associated. After two treatments, gumanda ang pakiramdam ko. My friends introduced me Manila Beijing Medical Associated and luckily I got cured. So I sincerely want to thank the doctors of Manila Beijing Medical Associated. For the past 30 years, ang dami ko nang natake na mga gamot, nothing happened to me. So until one my friend introduced me to Manila Beijing Medical Associated, you know what, all my illness was cured. For any health problems or incurable diseases, you can visit Manila Beijing Medical Associated Incorporated, located at 843B Sabino Padilla Street, Binondo, Manila. Landmarks, linggo, alas 6 hanggang alas 7 ng gabi. At least two people were killed and six more were missing after torrential rains and severe flooding in parts of Indonesia. The disaster agency said Friday, forcing the evacuation of hundreds of people. Heavy rain has pounded Indonesia for days, 
forcing the Sitarum River, dubbed the world's dirtiest on Java Islands, to burst its banks and causing deadly flash floods in the eastern part of the sprawling Southeast Asian archipelago. Residents in a dozen communities on the outskirts of Bandung City, east of the capital Jakarta, were forced to wade through streets filled with chest-high water in places. Images from the scene showed residents being moved to safety on pontoon boats and small wooden vessels. Floods and landslides killed a pair of residents in East Nusa Tenggara province on the island of Flores, the agency said. Six others are still missing and three people were injured, said a National Disaster Agency spokesman Sutopo Porvo Nugroho. Flooding is common during Indonesia's rainy season, which runs roughly from October to April. Crew Dragon, the new vessel built by SpaceX for NASA, is set to return Friday off the coast of Florida, the most perilous part of a mission to prove it can take U.S. astronauts to the International Space Station. Dragon will undock from the ISS Friday at 0731 GMT. Five hours later, the capsule will leave Earth orbit and re-enter the atmosphere. Testing its heat shield, splashing down is expected at 8.45 a.m. Eastern Time. The mission has been hitch-free thus far. Dragon docked with the ISS Sunday without incident, and the space station's three current crew members were able to open the hatch and enter the capsule. They closed the airlock Thursday. This time around, Dragon's own crew member is a dummy named Ripley. But if all goes well, the next flight will see two U.S. astronauts book a return trip to the ISS sometime before the end of the year, according to NASA. Its descent will be broadcast in its entirety by the NASA and SpaceX, thanks to, in large part to a camera embedded in Dragon. A NASA spokesman told media a drone would be on hand to try to film the capsule, which will be slowed by four parachutes as it falls. Long lens cameras have also been loaded onto the salvage boat. SpaceX did not broadcast images of Dragon's interior during the flight up to the ISS. In tennis, doubt is a distant memory for Novak Djokovic as the world's number one returns to Indian Wells on top of the tennis world one year after his shock loss to qualifier Taro Daniel. Djokovic is making his first start since winning his third Grand Slam title on Trout at the Australian Open in January. He said he wasn't fully recovered from elbow surgery when he opted to compete in the California desert last year, but it's not a decision he regrets given the events that followed in 2018. Djokovic would cement his return with a Wimbledon title and follow that with a U.S. Open crown. He dominated Rafael Nadal in January's Australian Open title and must be favored for a sixth Indian Wells crown, which would see him break the record he currently shares with fourth-seeded Roger Federer. And in football, Neymar will travel to Qatar to undergo a complete assessment six weeks into his recovery from a fractured right foot, Paris Saint-Germain said on Thursday. The Brazil forward watch on the stand at the Parc de Prince as PSG crashed out of the Champions League last 16 on Wednesday to Manchester United on an away goal for following a 3-1 defeat. The 27-year-old damaged the fifth metatarsal in his right foot in a French Cup win over Salzburg on January 23rd and was ruled out for 10 weeks. PSG were hoping he would be healed enough to get back on the pitch in time for potential Champions League quarterfinal in April, but the French side suffered a humiliating exit as United sensationally overturned a 2-0 first leg deficit. In the NBA, Giannis Antetokounmpo scored 29 points and made 12 rebounds as the league-leading Milwaukee Bucks regained their swagger by crushing to a 117-98 victory over the Indiana Pacers on Thursday. 
The box season had hit a snag as they were coming off losing back-to-back -back games for the first time this season when they failed to hold big leads against the Phoenix Suns and the Utah Jazz. The mini slump didn't last long though as they bounced back nicely against the Pacers and Chris Middleton added 27 points for the Bucks, who improved to an NBA best 49-16 on the season. Miles Turner had 22 points and Bohan Bogdanovic 17 for the Pacers who lost star guard Victor Olapido to a season-ending injury last month. The loss also ended Bogdanovic's streak of 5 straight to 20-point games. The Bucks have now beaten the Pacers in 4 out of 5 contests this season. Milwaukee went on a 12-0 run early in the fourth quarter to take command of the game. Milwaukee went on a 12-0 run early in the fourth quarter to take command of the game. Pacers Cal O'Quinn scored a basket to cut the Bucks lead to 84-74 to start the final quarter. Milwaukee's Ersan Ilyasova sparked the run with a three-pointer and Atletico cap it with a driving layup to make 96-74 with 8-21 remaining. And these are the stories for EN Sports. I'm Ben Bernaldez and I'm 1 with 25. With Japan keen to flaunt Tokyo 2020 as the Reconstruction Olympics, people who fled the Fukushima nuclear disaster are being urged to return home, but not everyone is eager to go. Watch this. そんな Don't forget to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Tumblr. Also, check out our boards and Pinterest and pictures on Instagram. I'm Sam Zipeta. Thanks for joining us. And I'm one with 25.